The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Touching Lives. Here's what I've discovered. I've discovered the problem with most people is not in finding the truth, it's in facing the truth. Truth's easy to find, facing it is another matter. Jesus said, we must not only affirm truth, we must accept truth. Teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This is Touching Lives with James Merritt. There was a man by the name of John. He was a disciple of Jesus. He lived with him for three years. After Jesus died and was raised from the dead and went back to heaven, John sat down and wrote his own version of his biography of the life of Jesus. And after having spent three, spending three years with the greatest man who ever lived, he said there was something about Jesus he never was able to get out of his mind. And it was one of the reasons why people who were so unlike Jesus liked Jesus. And people who you think would not be drawn to Jesus were drawn to him like a magnet draws, draws iron. This is what he said. He said, Jesus was a man who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And if you'll study the life of Jesus, you'll readily admit that He was absolutely full of grace, but He was also full of truth. Now, if you missed last week, we studied this story in the life of Jesus where it was grace. He was full of grace. And it was a story about a prostitute, a streetwalker who came to Jesus, and she didn't need truth. She knew truth. She knew who she was. She knew what she was. She needed grace. And so we studied this story last week about how Jesus gave her the one thing that she needed. She needed grace. Today, we're going to look at the Jesus of truth. We're going to delve into a conversation that Jesus had with a, a group of people that you and I know as Pharisees. And, and there were people who needed to hear the truth about truth. Today we're in John chapter 8. If you want to look on with me, if you've got a copy of God's Word or get out your Bible or your iPad or whatever you use, we're in John chapter 8. There are four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're right at the beginning of the New Testament. We're in John chapter 8. Now we're only going to look at a very small part. This is a very long conversation, very detailed conversation. We don't have time to look at it. We're going to look at just two sentences. But in two sentences, Jesus gives us a book full of truth about truth. Listen to what Jesus said. To the Jews who had believed Him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know, now this is important, that little word's big, the truth. The truth will set you free. Now Jesus said, there's such a thing as a truth, and there's such a thing as the truth. There is a truth with a little t, and there's big truth with a big t. There's earthly truth that's not life changing. Two plus two equals four. That's an earthly truth that won't change your life. But there is eternal truth, big truth, that is absolutely life changing. It can take a person from darkness to light and from death to life. Take you back to school for a minute. If, if you remember your math, you remember we studied a thing called <clears throat> prime numbers. And if you remember what prime numbers are, just curious. How many of you don't even care what prime numbers are? Just, okay, look. <laughs> Let me just take you back. A prime number is a number that is only divisible by itself, right? By itself and the number one. Now watch, if you remember, you remember there's only one number, prime number, that's an even number. Anybody know what that is? Two, all right? Two is the only even prime number. Every other number is an odd number. That's why they're called prime numbers. Now what Jesus is telling us is there are certain truths that are prime truths. That is, they're true for everybody, everywhere, at all times. So there are a lot of things that believers can disagree on. And by the way, I've never said this before. I haven't said it in a long time. I do not expect you to agree with everything I say. I really don't. I'm not even sure I agree with everything I say, okay? I don't expect you to agree with everything I say. If you always agreed with me on everything, one of us is unnecessary. But the fact of the matter is, there are a lot of things that we can disagree on, and we do. And that's why, why, that's why people ask me a lot, of, why do we have so many different denominations? Because there are certain things that we just can't agree on. Baptism, or, you know, uh, the Lord's Supper, or, you know, certain things like that. But then Jesus says, now there are prime truths over which there can be no division. 
Because if you divide over a prime truth, then one or both of you have either disregarded the truth, or you've denied the truth, or you have disobeyed the truth. And what Jesus tells us in these two little sentences tells us three things that we must always do with truth. Number one, Jesus said, we must affirm the truth. That is, we have to affirm there's such a thing as truth that never changes. Listen to what he says again. Then you will know the truth. Again, he didn't say you'll know a truth or you'll know some truth. You will know the truth. Jesus himself said, there is truth that is absolute. There is truth that never changes. There is truth that is always true. It is real truth, and you and I can know this truth. There is truth that's not a social construct. It's not subject to the different whims of different thinking at different times at different ages. There are certain truths with a capital T that are true for everyone, everywhere, every place, and every time, and you can know this truth truth. By the way, sin is not the only reason that Jesus came into this world. You know, when you ask people, so why did Jesus come into this world? The stock answer people give, well, he came to be our Savior. He came because there's sin. He came to save us from our sin. That's true. But that's not the only reason Jesus came into the world. As a matter of fact, there's a conversation that Jesus had with a man named Pontius Pilate. And he said something to Pontius Pilate. I never even noticed this before until a few weeks ago. He said something to Pontius Pilate, and he tells Pilate from his own words, this is why I came into the world. Listen to this. You say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Well, we're begging a big question. Jesus said there's such a thing as the truth. I came into the world to testify to the truth. Question, where do you find the truth? We would have to wonder about that. Jesus plainly tells us a few chapters later, Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, this is not what I'm saying. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying that this book, God's Word is, out, is the ultimate absolute truth, and it has to be, because if it is the Word of God, then it is what God says, and what God says is truth, because God cannot lie. Now, listen carefully. God does not say something because it's true. A thing is true because God says it. God does not say something because it's true. A thing is true because God says it. Now, let me tell you why this is a big deal. Unless there is an unchanging truth from an unchanging God that is never up for debate or discussion, then lasting morality is impossible. Because without an unchanging standard of truth that can only come from an unchanging God, guess what? Then what is right and what is wrong becomes a matter of personal opinion. So what's right is right for me, and what's right is right for you. What's right for you may not be right for me, and what's wrong for you may not be wrong for me. It's all up for debate. It's all just a matter of personally opinion. Well, that's true unless there is truth with a capital T. Because if, truth, if there's truth with a capital T, then what is morally right has to be morally right for everybody. And what is morally wrong has to be morally wrong for everybody. Here's why. If ultimate truth comes from God, if ultimate truth comes from God, it can never change because God never changes. If ultimate truth comes from God, it can never be untruthful because God cannot lie. If truth comes from God, then truth can never be wrong because God is never wrong. However, if, as we're being told today, we can manipulate truth, and, and, and we can wish, uh, you know, however we wish, our, our truth is just whatever we believe is true, then wrong can change just like that. That's why 40 years ago, things that we would have never dreamed people would say is right today, people are now saying is right today. Because if there's no unchanging standard of truth, right and wrong can change like that. I'm reminded of a story I read about Albert Einstein. He was teaching at a university, and he was giving a physics exam. So he handed the exam out to the students, and when they looked at the exam, a student raised his hand. He said, yes, sir. He said, Dr. Einstein, he said, the questions on this year's exam are the same questions from last year's exam. And Albert Einstein replied, oh, that's okay. This year, the answers are different. <laughs> now, that's what happens 
If there's no unchanging truth, the answers to the questions we asked 40 years ago are different. The problem is what is truly truth never changes. I love to, this is one of my sayings. Truth that is absolute never becomes obsolete. Truth that is absolute never becomes obsolete. Now, it may be out of fashion. Most people no longer believe it. It may be out of favor. Most people no longer like it. It may be out of friends. People don't even want to hear it, but it's never out of date because truth is always true no matter what century that it is. In other words, time has no effect on truth. what, What was true in 1017, ultimately, is true in 2017. What was true in 33 was true in 1933. Because truth is not only unending, truth is also universal. What is truly true isn't just true yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's also true for everybody and everyone everywhere. There was a grandmother that was talking to her granddaughter. She was trying to teach her some lessons about, you know, how to be a good person, how to be moral. And so she was talking to her granddaughter, and she says, now, honey, she said, you must always tell the truth. Always, no matter what, no matter, no matter how much it costs, always tell the truth. Always be honest. And the little girl got a kind of a puzzled look on her face, and she, you know, kind of wasn't quite sure. And she says, well, honey, is, is there something you don't understand? And the little girl said, Nana, I know it's wrong to tell a lie. But can you just give the truth an extreme makeover? (laughs) Now, what we're living today is in a culture that is giving truth an extreme makeover. Here's the only problem. Truth that is made over is just a lie with a lot of makeup. Truth that is made over is just a lie with a lot of makeup. Because without truth, morality becomes a moving target and nobody can hit it. But let me tell you, there's another problem. If there's no such thing as truth that never changes, it's true for everybody, everywhere, at all times. Not only does morality go out the window, justice goes out the window. How many of you have ever testified in a court of law? You're not admitting guilt, you just testified. All right, I've testified several times in court of law as a pastor, right? So I've testified. Every time I've testified, I've raised my hand and I've said, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Why is that a big deal? Why does it matter whether I tell the truth or not? Because without truth, there can be no justice. And so without truth, you can't have ultimately what's right and wrong. And without truth, you cannot have justice because justice is based on truth. Here's the point. There is truth that corresponds to reality, and there is reality that corresponds to truth. So, what is really true and what is truly real is always really true and always truly real for, real for everybody, everywhere, all the time. And Jesus said, we must affirm the truth. Now, you may sit there and you say, if that's all you got, I didn't need to be here today. Man, I'm, I'm with you. I affirm the truth. Oh, but that's not enough. Because not only must we affirm the truth, Jesus said we must accept the truth. Now, there's a difference between affirming the truth and accepting the truth. You may say, you know, I, I believe that's true, but I'm just not buying it. Okay? So, Jesus goes on to say, you will know the truth. Now, you wouldn't probably realize this, but in the Greek language, there's more than one word for the word know. One word means to know with your head. The other word means to know with your heart. One means that you know what truth is in your head. One means you accept truth into your heart. Now, this is where the real battle begins because it's one thing to affirm truth in your head. It's a totally different thing to accept truth into your heart. And that's where this battle is going on in our culture right now. Because listen, I don't have to tell you that the buzzword for today is not truth. The buzzword for today is another word that starts with a T, and it's called tolerance. Because I want to tell you something. You don't want anybody today to call you intolerant. That's bad. I mean, it's just nobody, nobody wants to be called intolerant. So here's what we're being told. We're to be tolerant of the actions of others, even if we believe they're morally wrong. We're to be tolerant of the attitudes of others, even if we think they're socially destructive. We're to be tolerant of the assertions anyone makes, even if we can prove those those assertions are wrong according to the truth. Now, before I go any further, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'll make something very plain. I am absolutely 
absolutely on, this, on the side of this issue. When it comes to the way we treat other people, we should never be intolerant. We should never be bigoted. We should never be mean-spirited. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if you like what I, what I you know, believe. I don't care if you don't like the Bible. I don't care if you don't like Jesus. I don't care if you don't like Christianity. I don't care if you don't see any moral issue my way. I, there is never an excuse for me to be intolerant of you or bigoted towards you or, 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 or mean-spirited towards you. That said, I want to share with you something a man by the name of Bishop Fulton Sheen wrote. You probably, 99% of you don't even know who Bishop Fulton Sheen was. Bishop Fulton Sheen was a, a Catholic bishop who lived in the, in the 20th century. At one time, he even, probably even more than the Pope, was the most popular, well-known Catholic in the entire world. He had a radio program. He had a TV ministry that, that 30 million people watched every single week. He was the leading Catholic theologian of his day. I want you to listen to what Bishop Sheen wrote. Okay, listen to this. He said, tolerance applies only to persons, but never to truth. Intolerance applies only to truth, but never to persons. Tolerance applies to the erring, intolerance to the error. Couldn't agree more. Bullseye nails it. But then he goes on to say this. Tolerance applies only to persons, but never to truth or principles. Now listen carefully to what he says. About these things, we must be intolerant. What he means is, when it comes to truth or principles, we must be intolerant. Right is right, if nobody's right. And wrong is wrong, if everybody's wrong. And in this day and age, we need not a church that is right when the world is right, but a church that is right when the world is wrong. You know when he wrote those words? 1931. 86 years ago. I have no doubt that if Bishop Sheen were alive today, he wouldn't be a bit surprised that we're now living in a day and an age when principled conviction has been replaced by political correctness. Here's what's happened. The truth has been silenced by the muzzle of tolerance. Can't tell the truth because if you do, you're going to sound intolerant. Well, can I just Vote for intolerance for just a moment. Can, can I just kind of maybe broaden your horizon and make you think that maybe intolerance is a good thing at the right time, at the right place? Let me give you an example. Most of us probably took chemistry in high school. You know what I learned pretty quick in chemistry in high school? There's not a lot of room for tolerance in the chemical laboratory. <laughs> when you're mixing certain chemicals, you better be intolerant. You better not say, well, que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. You may blow your school to smithereens. There's no room for tolerance in mathematics. Whether you are an engineer at NASA or you're the architect of a building, you better make sure the calculus is right. You better make sure the trigonometry is right. You, you better not have the attitude, well, I'm off by a few figures here. What does it really matter? The astronaut may not come back. I've discovered the problem with most people, it's not in finding the truth, it's in facing the truth. Truth's easy to find, facing it is another matter. Jesus said, we must not only affirm truth, we must accept truth. But that's not even enough. That's still not how far truth's got to get in your life. Because Jesus goes on to say, it's not enough just to affirm truth. Yeah, I believe there's truth that doesn't change. It's not even, you know, enough to say accepted. Well, okay, I accept the fact that it's true. Jesus said, we must apply the truth. We must apply the truth. Now, listen to what he says. You know, in order to know the truth, the real truth, you've got to know the one who is truth. And listen to what Jesus says back up in the first verse, verse 31. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, now this is so big. Listen, he didn't say if you read my teaching, like my teaching, listen to my teaching, or even learn my teaching. He said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Now, what Jesus meant by holding to his, his teaching was, you put it into action. You live by it. You make God's truth the standard by which you live your life. See, it's not enough just to learn the truth. It's not enough just to look for the truth. 
You've got to live out the truth. If truth is going to do for you and in you what it was meant to do, you must live by the truth. The greatest truth in the world is absolutely useless if you do not live by it and apply it to your life. So I go back to what I said earlier. Truth's not just for the head, it is for the heart. So this, this is kind of how it works. Your mind learns the truth. Your heart loves the truth. And then your will lives the truth. There is one who has the power to let you out of any prison. He hasn't found a door yet he can't unlock. He hasn't found a prisoner yet he can't set free. He hasn't found a jail yet he cannot break you out of. You know why? Because he doesn't just speak the truth. He is the truth. He is the truth. See, Atheism denies truth. Agnosticism doubts truth. Rationalism debates truth. Humanism degrades truth. Relativism dilutes truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the truth. And the only way you will ever know the truth is to know Jesus who is the truth. And let me tell you why this is so important. This is so big. Everybody lives their life according to one of three standards. Hit me like a ton of bricks today. Everybody's going to live their life. Everybody in this room, everybody listening to me at our other campuses, you're listening to me right now on the computer, television. You live your life based on one of three standards. One's what I call the cultural standard. I call this the Hollywood way because Hollywood sets the culture. Now, the cultural standard is, I'll tell you what I think is right. Whatever the culture says is right. Culture says it's right. I'm good with it. Culture says it's wrong. I'm bad with it. I'm down with it. Okay. So whatever the culture says, that's how I'm going to live my life. That's the way a lot of people live their life. The Hollywood way. The second standard is what I call the personal standard. It's the Hugh Hefner way. I'm going to live life the way I want to live life. It's my life. Nobody's going to tell me how to run my life. It's mine. I can do with it whatever I want to. I'll go where I want to go. I'll say what I want to say. I'll do what I want to do. And I don't really care what anybody else thinks. A lot of people live their life that way. But then there's a third standard. It's the scriptural standard. That's the heavenly way. And that's when you decide, you know, I believe this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I think I'm going to live my life according to this truth. So here's your homework this week. This is what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you to begin to read this book seriously and take it seriously. I'm going to ask you to do one of two things. For some of you, you're living in a situation, I don't know what your situation is, I'm not here to throw rocks or judge or anything, but you're living in a situation where you know you need to take some truth in this book and apply it to your life, and you need to make a change in the way you're living. I'm going to ask you to do that. There are some of you, you know of someone else, and they're living a lie. And their life's based on a lie. And they're not living according to what God would have them to do. They're not, they're, not, they're not experiencing God's best. And you owe it to them to love them enough to simply say, can I just share a truth with you that I want you to think about? I want you to mull over. I really believe if you would apply this truth to your life, I think it can make a great difference in your life. Because 2,000 years ago, a little baby was born in Bethlehem. That little baby lived for 33 years, and in that 33 years, he lived an absolutely perfect life, and he died on a cross for the sins of everybody else, and three days later, he was raised from the dead, and his name was Jesus, and that Jesus holds the key to joy and peace and fulfillment and satisfaction and salvation and eternal life. And if you ever come to know him personally, he will set you free. And that is the truth. Stay tuned for a final word from Dr. Merritt. One of the great joys in my life was becoming a father to my three wonderful sons. They've been the source of some of the greatest blessings in my life. When I first learned I was to be a dad, I turned to the scripture for advice and found a treasure trove of truth to help me become the best dad I could be. I was so moved by the wisdom I found in Proverbs that I wrote a book called What God Wants Every Dad to Know based on the teachings of King Solomon. For this Father's Day, I'm making this gift available to you for only $10, and I invite you to order a copy for yourself or someone that you know. 
It deals with all the hard topics of fatherhood, including finances, sex education, anger, friendships. Call our Help Center at 1-800-413-1131 or go to our website at www.touchinglives.org to order your copy today. Thanks for watching Touching Lives. Pray for all of the fathers you know on this Father's Day. And I would say this, Dad, to be transparent. Do an even better job of following what Solomon teaches us in God's Word than I did, and you will be a great dad. God bless you. Ask any builder, he'll say the first thing you have to do before you build a house is to make sure the land is surveyed and the property boundaries are well marked. Building a house without knowing the property lines means you run the risk of ruining the entire project. Living life is somewhat the same. You have to know the boundaries or you run the risk of living your life over the line, which can absolutely ruin you. We're halfway through a series called Balance where we're studying the relationship between grace and truth. This week's focus, is on truth. And I believe the Bible provides the perfect boundaries for living and they're wrapped in the only truth that matters, which is God's truth. If you're ever to have any hope of knowing the truth, you've got to start with knowing Jesus personally. Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. And I believe a personal relationship with Jesus is the only way to live a balanced life and that is the truth. We've got one final message in this series, and you really won't want to miss this last episode as we seek to become balanced in our understanding of grace and truth. I really look forward to seeing you next week. And remember, every time you watch us, pray for us at Touching Lives. Touching Lives, teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This program is sponsored by Touching Lives Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.